Hello, everyone. Can you see my slides? Just say something in the chat window if it's all good and go from there, I guess. Beautiful. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if uh, we've got the host, but I will try and stick to the time limit. Uh, OK, everyone, once again, hello, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your relevant time zones. For those of you who don't know, my name's Melroy, and I work with the Australian Access Federation uh, looking after the Australian Orchid Consortium because we're also Australian Orchid Consortium leads. And uh, what I'm going to talk today about is a maturity model for persistent identifiers. And uh, my question to you as uh, part of the PID community is, is it too soon to have maturity model for PIDs? Or uh, is it too soon to be looking at uh, maturity of PIDs? So what we're doing is we recently run a survey. And I'll be talking a bit more about that in this presentation. So moving on. Uh, now, persistent identifiers, they've been around for the last 20 odd years in different shapes and forms. And that's about long enough for us to actually start observing uh, patterns of success or failure. Now, uh, when you talk about maturity, so uh, mature technology is one that is either in use for a long enough time that it doesn't have early teething problems or that if it did have it, it has been reduced by further developments or it might not necessarily be around for a long time, but uh, it's an, or not seen widespread use, but it's very understood by the community that's using it. So. Uh, it could also be mature in that way. So if this is uh, the definition we look at, then the pits that I'm familiar with, like ORCIDs, DOIs, and even IGSNs, they all qualify as mature pits. So, but uh, my question is, should we be measuring the maturity of pits or uh, the maturity of an organization itself, because in this presentation, what we're going to do is rather than focus on the maturity of PIDs, we're looking at the maturity of a community that is using persistent identifiers. In this particular case, it's the Australian Orchid Consortium as the community. And before we go ahead and measure what the maturity of the consortium is like, we need to understand and define what maturity is. So uh, based on the discussions that we've had uh, internally, we decided that, OK, we are going to say a consortium member is mature in their use of ORCID ID when they start to realize the benefits of the ORCID integration. So it's not just enough to have done an ORCID integration, but you also need to realize benefits of that ORCID integration. Now, if you were to go by uh, the JISC ARMA cost-benefit analysis report that was done a uh, fair few years ago when ORCID was piloted in the UK. Uh, one of the things that uh, the report indicated was that uh, there may be some benefits that are realized immediately, but most benefits uh, would be realized within two to four years post-integration. So if that is the case, then uh, maybe the best time to do it would be two to four years after an integration is done is when you'd like to start looking at the maturity of an organization. Now, uh, the National Orchid community in Australia, uh, we launched the consortium back in 2016 because the community identified that there was a need for orchids to be used in Australia. They wanted a national strategy. They wanted a national vision, so they decided Australian Orchid Consortium was a good way to go about it. It started off with 40 members, and in the first year, 
52% of the members had done one uh, integration with Orchid. Now, move over to 2017. And at the end of 2017, the consortium was still 40 members, but this time 62.5% integrated with Orchid. Now, 2018 was a good year. And the reason being because not just 70.7% of the consortium members had integrated their Orchid, had integrated Orchid, had integrated with Orchid, but Australian Research Council, who is also a consortium member and one of the biggest research funding bodies in Australia, announced that they would be they would start to use Orchid as part of their grant application process. This itself was quite beneficial for the community itself because it was a notice by a big national funding body that everybody looks to to get funds saying that, yes, we're considering ORCIDs and we're going to use, start using ORCIDs as part of our workflow, which really uh, bought ORCID up in, which elevated the position of ORCID itself. Now, in 2019, the consortium grew by one member and 78% uh, of them had integrated their systems with ORCID. And by 2020, of the 42 members the consortium has, 83% uh, had integrated their had integrated their systems with ORCID. Now, in 2020, we launched a maturity assessment survey. And uh, the reason we did it in 2020 was, if you look back at my previous slide where I said, uh, some of the benefits, most benefits would be realized within two to four years after integration. So what that means is the 52% of our members who had integrated in 2016 would start seeing uh, benefits by 2018 and should have realized at least most of their benefits by 2020. Those in 2017 would start realizing a few benefits by 2019. And then uh, those who integrate in 2018, while they may not necessarily start seeing a lot of benefits, they would have realized, they would actually start realizing some of it sometime in this year. So just by looking at that, uh, one of the things we were trying to figure out is uh, now doing a maturity assessment is quite taxing. It's not easy and it requires a lot of work. So why exactly were we doing it? Uh, firstly, we wanted to understand the usage of ORCID within the community. Now, as consortium lead, part of our role is to help our members leverage maximum benefits of the ORCID integration. It was one of the reasons uh, the consortium was formed, uh, apart from having a national strategy and a vision, what they wanted to do was leverage as much benefits as they could get from the ORCID integration. Now, to do that, what we need to understand is how ORCID is being used within the community, because if you don't understand how our community is using it, we wouldn't be able to uh, know what sort, of ben what sort of benefits the community would get or how the community would benefit or how our members would benefit. Uh, and while it allows us to help our members also understand how they can use ORCID within the community itself to get most benefits out of it. But uh, we also wanted to help our members understand how they are using ORCID. So how their use of ORCID within the community actually contributes towards the enrichment of the research ecosystem and how uh, they use their ORCID uh, within the community would actually give them more benefits than they actually are currently getting. So it's just a matter of aligning uh, those perspectives. Now, what sort of methodology did we use? The first thing we did was we tried to identify who should participate. Uh, that was, uh, it wasn't uh, much of a debate there because we'd already decided that, well, those consortium members who've done an ORCID integration would be, would be the ones that would be participating in the survey because they would be the ones who would have the most to gain in understanding what sort of benefits they're realizing. 
then our next task was to identify the sort of tool uh, we were using to carry out the survey. Now we needed a tool that not only does uh, surveys, but it also allows for people to save it halfway through the survey and come back to it because the survey itself was, wasn't very long, but it was comprised of different sections and may have required a number of people within an organization to feed input into it, which is why that was one of the things we are looking for. And then lastly, what we wanted was a bit Based on the answers uh, our respondents gave to the survey, it we wanted it to generate a PDF report and give them recommendations on what they could do to take it a step further. Now, now uh, the tool that we identified was this tool called AnyPlace Survey, which has since worked quite well for us. Then we were looking at what sort of evaluation criteria we need to go for. So we decided to evaluate them on four different categories, general, technical, user experience, and then communication and engagement. And all these categories that we have listed over here are based on the ORCID Collect and Connect program. So what we did was we went through the Collect and Connect program, identified all the points where ORCID would generally certify an integration as being compatible with the program. And then we translated that into easier language that uh, a researcher, a research administrator, or even a librarian at a university would be able to answer and understand. Then we worked on a communication and engagement plan. So our communication and engagement plan was effectively, uh, when are we going to launch the survey? Who are we going to communicate before we launch the survey? How are we going to communicate it? Identify the individuals at each member institution that have done an integration, and then send them individual personalized links to the survey and get them to then answer it. And then lastly, but definitely not the least, comes the assessment or the analysis part of our methodology. So I bet everybody's quite interested in finding out what our results were. So we send the survey to 33 of our members who did an integration. We received a 96% response rate. Now, of the 96%, uh, what we've noticed is that, sorry, yeah, about uh, 24 of our members who responded to the survey uh, we're in the general category, uh, we're in the intermediate section for the general category. Uh, the technical category, most of them were in the advanced section. Again, with user experience, uh, most of the members are polled uh, towards the intermediate section. And then with our communication and outreach, almost a lot of them had uh, advanced, uh, were in an advanced stage of their communication and outreach communication and outreach uh, media right our overall consortium maturity uh, what we found out was that 80 percent of our respondents uh, were identified as being of an intermediate maturity level so across all the four sections when you're looking at uh, general technical, user experience and uh, communication and outreach. Across all of those sections, uh, the average they polled was intermediate, and that was about 80% of our respondents. 13% uh, of our respondents were beginners, and 7% polled as advanced. Now, we need to remember that the survey we sent out was a self-assessed survey, so to me, uh, these answers, while they are quite interesting, they're also, I think, on a bit conservative side of things based on what I know is happening with the members in the consortium. It could be that they were quite, uh, they weren't very sure about whether to answer more about what they're doing or whether the information is less. But I'll come more to that in the takeaways that we've, that we took out of this.
So now, one of the questions we asked in our survey, because uh, I talked about how you need to realize those benefits of the integration, and was we asked, can you use your integration to report on ORCID statistics within your organization itself? So we had 79% of our respondents say yes, they uh, can use their integration to report on the ORCID statistics and they, they were doing so. 21% said no. Then we also asked them if they were using data from uh, their integration for excellence in research Australia exercise. So that's the ERA exercise to inform other organizational business decision. Now, just to put this in perspective, uh, in 2020, we just had the ERA exercise. I don't know if it was 2019, but we just recently had the ERA exercise. And one of the things that we wanted to find out was those members who had done an integration prior to that, were they in a position to use that information in this particular exercise? And 44% of our respondents said yes, they used it. 56% uh, said no. So takeaways. Uh, what I wanted to, what we got out of this is when you're looking at the right time to assess maturity, there never is a right time. It only depends on the technology that's being used and how the community is using it. So while you might have a technology that's really mature, if your community isn't using it in a mature way, if your community has no understanding of how it needs to be used, then there is no point in trying to assess the maturity of that particular technology or of the community in general. So uh, there never is a right time to do that. Uh, some of the lessons we learned is uh, that we needed to identify what our community needs rather than what they want, because occasionally we get people to come and tell us uh, we have members telling us that they want to try and reduce, uh, they try and want to uh, reduce burden on their researchers by improving administrative processes, and they want to make it easier for them to do grant applications. Uh, we also need to take time and understand what it is that the community actually wants. Uh, another thing that we did was uh, we communicated a fair bit, and we had to follow up quite a lot. And because this is a self-assessed survey, as I mentioned earlier, results are on the conservative side. But what we are going to do is, of this survey, we're going to do a follow-up, or we're going to be calling it the phase two part of the survey, in which we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation session with each member who's answered the survey, and go over their responses and ask them if they had any questions, if there's anything they were not clear about, and uh, try and rectify the survey if we find any discrepancies. But uh, most importantly, uh, if you're doing an exercise like this, you definitely need support from your team and peers because it is a long exercise. And given the interesting year that 2020 was, the support and help definitely helped, definitely uh, went a long way. So uh, before I end my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the AFP and especially Jacinta uh, because she uh, helped me brainstorm uh, this presentation and the stuff uh, we wanted to get out and communicate. Uh, I also would like to thank Elena, who is our Chief Operating Officer, and Teddy, who is our Technical uh, and Engagement Manager, uh, for their constant support and making sure that uh, they're always encouraging uh, to try and make sure we get all our respondents to answer the survey. But mostly, I'd also like to thank Brian for all his feedback in helping Brian from Orchid, that is, uh, in helping us uh, uh, develop the questions that went into forming part of the survey. So, yeah, are there any questions? Oh. Any questions?
Right, any questions? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Melroy? Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you for persevering. So we've had a few um, we've had a oh. few questions. There's a there are a couple of questions in the question box. Yes, I can see them. Okay, so Sheila is asking if there are many organizations left in Australia that have not yet joined the consortium. Uh, when you're looking at higher education institutions like the universities, there are just a couple of them left that have not yet joined the consortium. Uh, there are uh, most of the medical research institutes and the uh, centers for regional uh, excellence that have also not join the consortium, but that is something that uh, we are looking at. Also, uh, another question from Sheila is for organizations that have not yet integrated the ORCID APS, were you able to give them an assessment or recommendation as well? Well, for those organizations, because we've just got about six or seven organizations within the consortium who haven't done an integration, and of the six or seven, all of them are currently testing it out. So hopefully by this year, they would all have done an integration. But we were looking at doing a small survey to find out more as to why it is they haven't gone ahead with an ORCID integration as opposed to uh, giving them an assessment or recommendation as well. Uh, the third question, uh, did you distinguish between vendor integrations versus custom integrations? Yes, we did distinguish between vendor integrations and custom integrations. Uh, so with, with the vendor integrations, most of our vendor integrations, are, the vendor integrations are your standard vendor integrations like eprints, pure, symplectic, symplectic elements. And those, uh, those in, there's nothing wrong with those integrations as such, but the idea is using information from those integrations to inform business processes or work on excellence in research exercises. So that is what we're try trying to find out is you might have a vendor system or you may have a custom system that you've designed yourself, but are you using that information? And if you're not using the information, why aren't you using it and what it is that we can then do to help you? So hopefully when we uh, sit down with them and have that one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, we'd find out more about it. And if you do this assessment again in five years, what do you think uh, the chances are that any of the organizations slide backwards in terms of maturity due to things like staff turnover or budget cuts. Personally, uh, it's like, it's asking how long is a piece of string? Now I don't have a crystal ball as such, but what I can tell is that uh, in about five years, I do not think any organization would be sliding backwards, at least in terms of maturity. Uh, because by then, uh, hopefully most of the organizations that are joining the consortium, we would have had at least products that would be able to help them to a certain extent. Uh, having said that, it would have been established for a longer time. So we, the consortium's already been running for five years. And uh, five years from now, uh, it would have, uh, I'm hoping, that we would be in a better position having learned all these lessons now to help our members keep on moving ahead and keep progressing with uh, the technology. Uh, also, what I wanted to uh, mention, uh, Sheila, is that uh, you said you'd be interested in doing something like this 